Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. All right, today on The Less Stressed Life, I have Dr. Robert Whitfield, who's a board-certified plastic surgeon with 26 years of experience. He specializes in breast implant removal surgery, breast implant illness, and advanced cosmetic procedures. After his residency and schooling in Las Vegas, Nevada, where he grew up, he relocated to Austin, Texas, where he's become renowned for his cosmetic expertise, staying at the forefront of his field. He's a sought-after provider for his Holistic Accelerated Recovery Program, which helps patients repair and recover from surgical procedures by lowering systemic inflammation. So we'll talk about all these things. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rob. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So I just mentioned to you offline, we had Dr. Emily Gutierrez. I don't think it's Dr. Emily Gutierrez, who is a wonderful PA or NP in the Austin area serving pediatrics in pandas and other conditions. She right. came on some time ago to talk about her story with breast implant illness. So she had gone to you. So I knew your name from that. And it's so fun to now get the other side of the table. So it's an interesting niche, a very needed one, but it's an interesting niche. So how did this happen that you got really interested in breast implant illness? My background is in oncology. Mm-hmm. So the first part of my career was spent doing reconstructive oncologic surgery. So I would help with head and neck cancer patients, sarcoma patients, and then, of course, breast cancer patients. And I did what's called a deep flap reconstruction. So that takes the tissue from the lower abdomen connected to the blood vessels, but spares the nerves. And you can reconstruct the breast that way with their own tissue. So that's what I was known for. And I would care for patients with implant-related issues, either from reconstructive issues, cosmetic issues, radiation injury, what have you, and use that technique usually to sort out those problems. I did develop a fair amount of experience with just caring for patients with implant-related problems. Fast forward to 2016, I had a patient from actually the Atlanta area relocate to Austin, like a lot of people do now. And uh, just didn't want to have a breast reconstruction anymore. She'd had one done with implants and just wanted to go flat. And it's more of a movement now to just uh, go flat from the procedure itself, which is fine. And I worked with her, did her consultation, went through all of her cup, her diagnostic studies, anything available. And she didn't have anything specific other than fatigue, which a lot of patients who went through cancer treatments have a lot of fatigue from bone marrow suppression. That was pretty normal. Everything else was within limits that you would expect. So I did her surgery and for everybody listening, there's a lot of things written about the on-block technique or total capsulectomy technique. And from an oncologic standpoint, we always try to take everything out intact. And for, obviously, there's cancer recurrence. We try to be always very careful of that. And then we're always looking at those devices to make sure there's not an infection or something like that underlying. I did her surgery, and my routine was to see everybody at a week and then a month and at three-month intervals. So I saw her at a week and went through her information, and she had no evidence of recurrent cancer, which is obviously paramount in these cases. But she had on her laboratory analysis, the culture swabs we did to look for bacteria, she had an E. coli and not just a little bit of E. coli, she had an E. coli infection. So based on the laboratory values, she had an E. coli infection. And that was really startling to me. My sister is a breast cancer survivor who recently passed away. And I would have been you know, mortified if somebody had missed an implant infection. So I, was, I went back through all of my notes and everything. And I was, How did I miss this? And There wasn't a specific tell. She wasn't red. She didn't have pain. She didn't have a capsular contracture. She didn't have a laboratory analysis that was concerning. She didn't have fluid on some study that would indicate there would be a problem. It just was not, nothing added up. 
And so it was really still a very bothersome thing for me, to be honest. I treated her with antibiotics based on the pattern of sensitivity reported by the hospital. And what do you know? All of her fatigue went away. So this poor lady had walked around for I don't know how long with this problem. And it was really an underlying implant infection. So basically, I believe she got on social media and put me on some list of surgeons who would do explants because I did nothing. And all of a sudden, my office where I was working got calls for explant surgery. And a uh, little concern about what had happened with that patient led me just to try to listen as carefully as possible and try to understand these what seemed to be odd complaints at the time and things I didn't really appreciate, like brain fog was a little confusing to me when I first started communicating with patients about it. So I had to get it explained to me and just like symptoms of chronic inflammation ended up being the tell for all of this with obviously an implant in place. And uh, we've done a lot of work with genetics as part of my program, toxicity testing, gut health testing, food sensitivity testing and hormone testing just to try to round out a picture of what's actually going on with the patient and then help them. Yeah, you can't unsee what you start to learn. And then as you start to ask people these questions, I bet it was popping up again and again, the same complaints. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about why the implants are getting infected, just so we're clear. And then do you want to talk a little bit about these different procedures that can be done? Because this reminds me, my bad analogy is that this reminds me of having a filling taken out, there's probably a good way and a bad way to do this. Sure. Yeah. What's happening in the breast wow. implant illness? Like, why is mold forming? I have a lot of questions. Like, why was it common to always swab, but the infection was unusual? I hear about mold being in issues. I saw a woman talk about her explant with you. She said her saline bag deflated and she just felt like crap. Why would she feel? What's going on that she feels like crap when the saline deflates? What else is going on in the tissue? I will, I'll clarify a couple of things. So the internet is obviously always champion in this. Whatever you read on the internet, it's got to be true. Mm -hmm. So basically we have the most PCR tested samples in the world regarding breast implant illness. And I've done them since 2019 consecutively. So about 30% have a biofilm or bacterial contaminant and that's predominantly the problem. Only a handful, I think it's up to six cases out of 2,000 of mine have had fungus. Mm. It's not a mold issue at all. Cool. So it's a, a bacterial contaminant. Typically in the bacteria is usually cutie bacterium acnes. It's found in our skin. Obviously with the name acnes, it's an acne. But your face, your neck, your chest skin, your shoulder skin, that's the predominant area where this is found in really high concentrations. So how does it get involved with the implant on its surface? And so there's really three ways to get biofilm contamination. So biofilm is just a colonization of bacteria on the surface of a device. It could be hip implant, breast implant, knee implant, dental implant, doesn't matter what it is. The way it happens is if someone were to hand a surgeon a contaminated implant, so they opened it and they contaminated it and hand it to the surgeon to put in, the other would be the surgeon somehow contaminates it on placement by touching skin or using a proper technique. And then the third, which is really the most common way, is by a bloodborne type bacterial infection or contamination. If you got a skin cut and got red and inflamed, that would have a bacterial component to it. If you had a cold, if you got a kidney a urinary tract infection, if you got a GI problem, those are all ways to get an infection. They've been around forever. So none of that's new. That's pretty standard in terms of devices and infections. So this is a patient population that starts usually getting these very young in life. Uh, a typical thing is there's two peaks. It's right after people get out of school. That could be 18 or up to 24, I guess. We'll just pick high school, college age. I don't think any of us are terribly well equipped at that age to make a lot of complicated decisions about medical devices. And I was never a fan of that because my background's in oncology. I really wasn't talking to young people. Then the next peak is usually in the 30s. And that's basically after people have had their families and they've had children and they're trying to get some type of rejuvenation, whatever that looks like for them. 
And so that's obviously a different conversation because those people are older, they got more life experience. Those were typically the people I got faced with who are facing problems with breast cancer. So that's a little bit easier to talk to that group because they're in a different life situation. So I think there's a lot of factors that go into this problem. And I've yet to discuss really the underlying problems with your genetics and your diets and everything else in your environment. So if we were big picture, infections happen with medical devices. That's what happens when you put a foreign body in your body. So this isn't new, but we're just putting more, we're shining more of a light on it now. And people have been walking around tired <laughs> or other symptoms. What are the most common and less common symptoms that you're seeing from breast implant illness? The most common things are really related to chronic inflammation in each body system. So in neurologic so symptoms, yeah, that's the problem with it. So if you sit across from somebody or your GP's office, you just say, I got a headache. I feel like my heart races. I'm short of breath. My gut's a problem. I can't eat stuff. I'm sensitive to everything. I got nerve pain in my arms and legs and joint pain. And they're just like, what? That doesn't make any sense. So that's, I feel like that's how a lot of people... It goes off the rails right there because you just named every body system and now you have a problem in every body system and that doesn't make sense to anybody. Mm -hmm. And rashes, right? And everything. But yeah. I the see a lot of skin stuff. Always like skin stuff. So when you start having skin symptoms, that's usually at the end of it. Yeah. Intractable UTIs, bacterial vaginosis, all these things. When I hear them, I'm like, oh, mm. now you've gone really down the deep end here because your body is just unhappy and there's not a lot of recourse at that point. Now, I don't have to convince anybody to have surgery. People are self-selecting to come in and be seen and I just listen to them. And if it's from a symptom inventory matches all the things or basically what I just described, plus they've had devices and issues, I let them in an informed decision way come to a conclusion that makes sense for them. For sure. Yeah. I see people at that skin level where it's like the thing that pushes them over the edge or it's a visual problem at that point. So I understand. So you just mentioned kind of the peaks of when implants are put in. And I think I'm looking at this with a biased view of, I don't really know. Did we pass the land, the height of implants? I'm not from California, so I don't know. Does everyone there still get an implant or is that becoming less popular? And you may not know this question either because it's not really your audience. But do you have any read on what you think the current culture landscape of getting implants is? I get asked a lot. People will host, will try to pigeonhole me about, well, I, would I let my daughter get implants? She had to be 16. First of all, my daughter's a Leo for everybody listening. You can't tell them anything. So it's pointless to try. Much like you couldn't get told anything when you were 16, 17, 18 years right. old, I was right. I think implants will always get, and once again, it's more about trying to arm people with the appropriate level of understanding of the implication of having a medical device. It's not, you're not going to change behavior that way. So that's not the right question to even ask. Yeah. Inspiration or desperation. And on that note, do people come in as emergencies sometimes, or are you getting people that are usually there for a thought out planning to remove? Well, I have a pretty deliberate group now that they've done a fair amount of investigation on their own. They've probably listened to my show and many other shows that I've been on and come to their own conclusions about both what they've been experiencing and, and maybe other interpretation of that experience by other providers. And then they'll come see us or do some kind of discovery virtual session. And I try to listen to everybody and make sure that I fill in the appropriate level of context around what they're experiencing. But many people now are very educated when they come to me. Yeah, which makes your job a little easier, I would imagine. Yeah. Parts of it, for sure. Yeah, it's hard to tell someone something that they don't think is a problem, right? Which is okay. Yeah. What is the lifespan of implants? I thought it was 10 years. Does it not really matter at all? And is, is, are people counseled on this when they're implanted? It probably just depends. But Going back to my training, we were very specific and had discussions between both the longevity. We were always talking about eight to 10 years for our cancer patients and evaluations. And whether they're diagnostic with uh, MRIs or uh, physical exam and MRI, we were always very like careful 
And I just treated my cosmetic patients the same way I treated my oncologic patients. So I wasn't parsing out how I took care of anybody, which always served me well. So I would have that discussion relatively soon. I saw people annually, regardless of what I had done for them. So I would start those conversations. I honestly see a lot of people who never had any conversations about anything and didn't follow up. Maybe they moved or their surgeon moved or just a, a host of, I would say, not what I would call great follow-up. Because if it's an oncology patient and they said, oh, I'm moving to Chicago. I'm like, okay, once you establish care in Chicago, we need to know the name and we'll send all the records to that group. And then you got to have continuity of care. So sure. that, that's how I always treated it the same way. I just thought that was a bit easier. I'm pretty easy to find. I had a lady find me that I operated on in 2009 the other day. And you're all over it when you got three social media profiles or four or five. Easy to well, well, yeah. Usually they don't, I mean, unless they pass away or something, they're around. You can yeah. you find them. Yeah. So what do you think is the lifespan of implants? You said 10 years, 10 to, you said that was normal in oncology to follow up within eight to 10 years, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I saw all my patients that way. I saw put in implants about almost five years ago now. But I would still see everybody on that time frame. The devices from a structural standpoint are better. That doesn't mean people can't have problems. The, the larger issue is you can't pick your parents, you can't outrun a bad diet, and your environmental exposure risks go up and up. So those are the things that really affect people in a bad way with any, without implants, you can have problems. Totally, yeah. So with implants, you can really get a lot of problems. So we'll talk about genetics and environmental exposures next, but first, one more question about being a surgeon, which is talk to us about the techniques of taking implants out. And if someone is considering this, what do they maybe need to know about a better or worse way to do it? We do lots of explants, but mostly what I do now is explants with or without fat transfers to try to revolumize. So you can do breast augmentation with fat alone. It's easier to do when someone's had children or weight loss, weight gain, the skin's kind of stretched out. So when we're a little bit older or not younger skin, obviously everything's great when we're younger and skin's all tight and everything like that. But I try to take them out all intact because I've had a patient, I've had two patients with cancer, one with a breast, one with a lymphoma. And then as I said, about 30% have this kind of bacterial contaminant with a handful only of fungus. I'm not trying to distribute that throughout the tissues. I'm trying to get it out without, if you want to think of it, spilling or creating more of a problem. Yeah. Are you ever removing them once they've already gotten a hole? Oh, there's always leaking stuff. Yeah. That's pretty common. I take out things that were from the 80s still, which is pretty funny. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's talk about as your practice really expanded, I feel like we're always just looking for answers. We want to help solve problems, but Talk to me about how you're feeling about genetic and environmental exposures affecting your patient population. Yeah, I think the things that we didn't have insight into when I first started doing it in 2016, 17, 18, 19, was like, what are the SNPs or the single nucleotide polymorphisms in our genetic code that just predispose us to problems? And if we have limited detox capability in our pathways, that just sets us up for problems in general. And we do a lot of functional genetic testing in my practice. I've been curious about genetics really since college, and I've had so many vendors now. And we're about to use a new one in Vision Labs that actually allows us to do pharmacodynamic testing so we can better adjust your anesthetic choice. For us, we looked at things in your vitamin D pathway, things in the methylation pathway, people have probably heard of MTHFR, that's a common thing. So how you methylate your B vitamins, how you manage your glutathione and your antioxidant pathway and vitamin C's and antioxidants, everybody's familiar with that. So if you have problems in those four pathways, you're gonna be really more susceptible to what I see in terms of chronic inflammation with breast implant illness. I think that's pretty standard, but it holds true when you look at the patients and their genetic profiles. And then we look at a lot of toxicity testing to look for what exposures have people had and mold's a big problem in Texas. And a lot of the patients have been exposed with the toxin, aflatoxin being high in, in the majority of them. 
We don't see tons of heavy metals, although I had a high profile client with a lot of heavy metals, presumably from leaching from a barrel sauna. And then environmental exposures can be all over the place, honestly. Triclosins, which are antibacterial glyphosates from the crop desiccants that are associated with contaminants in food, the molds in food, moldy coffee, wine, phthalates and plastic bottles. You can just go like laundry list up and down. And I've had people show up with all of them. And they're all pretty startled when they see the reports. And I used to take out devices with the capsules and do all this work. And some people get better right away. That's probably the third I described with the biofilm. And about two thirds would just take up to a year or longer to get better. And I'd have to send them out to functional medicine providers and nutritionists and whoever could help us take care of them. Now we have all that in-house. We have our own detox program in-house and functional providers and health coaches and a real good relationship with a psychologist and psychotherapist, Amanda Savage Brown, who wrote the book Busting Free. So we run it now more like a multidisciplinary program I would for cancer care. Yeah. I understand why you do that, right? It just makes it easier and that way you can control the quality of that for your clients and see their positive outcomes and not just wonder if they got taken care of well. So it makes sense. We're looking for folks to get better. And in our office, you're here for about a week because most of my patients come from out of state, honestly. And we have hyperbaric in our office. Lymphatic massage with a balancer pro and, and lymphatic masseuse and red light therapy and a host of other things, stem cell therapy and peptides. When you started adding some of that stuff, how fast were you seeing them recover? Because you're doing that for quicker recovery, generally, a lot of that stuff, right? Better outcomes. Yeah. Emily convinced me to get hyperbaric. Oh, uh, she almost convinced me to get hyperbaric. I love yeah. her for that. <laughs> she did so well after surgery. She was just really a couple of weeks ahead. And so that's a huge deal for me. And so anything I can do to help clients recover faster, we give all this advice and recommendations on diet. If you come to my office and you're having surgery, your pre-op, I'm going to give you a gift card to the well, which is one of the only seed oil free, gluten-free, dairy-free restaurants in Austin. Because I want you to eat a certain way. I'm not doing it for any other reason than to get you feeling better quicker after surgery. Just like everything in my office is, is engineered and the team's ready to help you. If you don't put in the right things, it's going to be really challenging for you from a nutrient standpoint afterwards. So we give right. them all enzymes and free form aminos and a powder. And we have liposomal formulations of my supplements to reduce inflammation pre-op and post-op. And we keep them on those for a year. And we use cell core for detox with our practitioners afterwards based on their toxicity profile. So we're trying to do everything in a supervised way and, and follow up with repeat testing as needed so that people aren't falling out, so to speak. Yeah, no, that makes sense. The less crap in, the easier it is for your body to clear stuff out, especially in recovery mode, yeah. which is so nutrient dependent. So you answered some of my questions about what you're doing pre and post-op to reduce inflammation, which is great. A lot of tactical things they can do at home and in office, like you said. Something that has come up lately that I've been seeing is talking about sauna being a contraindication during implants. And then you brought up sauna and the leaching, the possible heavy metal thing. So I love sauna, but there's, there's always like a double-sided story. So talk about that one. Oh yeah, I've gotten in much trouble for this. I went on a show and I, let's put it this way, anything that has chemicals in it, you can leach out of at a certain temp or in a certain way. And barrel saunas can get up to 212, I think, or 220. They get extremely hot mm -hmm. versus an IR sauna, which gets maybe what, tops like 150, 170, depending on which yeah, the exactly. vendor it is. So although it's less likely with that, if you listen to patients, they'll report they feel unwell after a sauna when they have devices in place. So what's going on? Does that, are they creating their own Herx reaction, basically, yeah. using that? My sneaky suspicion, given the fact that I've seen two, I don't know, probably 4,000 patients with this problem and heard this story over and over again is, yes, they're causing themselves a problem. So we just have our patients refrain from that once they decide that they're going to work with us because I need one less thing out of my control 
And then we just have them wait about 90 days after surgery. And then like an IR sauna is fine. I, I wouldn't go straight into some hardcore barrel sauna. But once again, the hardest thing to control is behavior. I just right. got to give you the best possible advice about yeah. that. I don't think we even do breast implants on our intake form. And that should be an automatic. I should just add it to my sauna best practices. Just don't go if you have breast implants, right? That doesn't make sense for you. It doesn't. I take so much stick over this, but I don't really care. The things you don't know, and I asked this question to some folks. I said, do you think when the studies were done, they ever took all the patients and shoved them in a sauna just to do a little before and after and, and see what it was like? No, of course not. So yeah. how would you know? Yeah. And that's how we learn things is through experience, right? Someone goes to the sauna and they say, I feel good. To be honest, it's not a real, it's not a super common report if you're no. not really toxic inside. And the most that would happen from mold, other things, but there's ways to mitigate it. But I think all, I always think like bad experiences are the most educational sometimes. So yeah. they have I'm, the biggest I'm, impact. I'm fine with taking stuff over. It's fine. I'll, yeah. Okay. But for your client, they remember, <laughs> I could go do that thing. Stopped a lot of trouble. It's headed off some things for me. So you talked a little bit about nutrients, modalities before and after for reducing inflammation, but you've really expanded your testing toolbox as you've supported your explant clients. For me, it's there's I've used a lot of tests and now I don't use a lot of tests as after a while. Do you have things you feel like you are running on all of your explant? clients no matter what yeah our strategic holistic accelerated recovery program runs those tests fundamentally if i get somebody we'll say with no other integrative care or functional care then we're going to look at their functional their genetics their toxicity profile gut microbiome food sensitivities and their hormones are a more comprehensive handle to get a really good picture of what's going on and then put them on our inflammation support bundle, which is mostly liposomal, because I have a lot of people with a lot of absorption issues, probably just like you do. That's not a capsule-based or tablet-based formulation. They're mostly liposomal for glutathione, D3K2, methylated Bs, and vitamin C. And just that alone will help lower their inflammation because they're now trying to support their pathways fundamentally. And then I tell them all, as, as much as it pains them, that they're going to have to cut out gluten, cut out dairy, cut out processed sugars, don't eat seed oils, and just try to lower their inflammation. I wrote about this in my book that's coming out this year. And then you have all these other things, like what's next? Peptide therapy, well, the FDA has gotten a little interesting yeah. about this. Peptides work really well in recovery, things like PPC-157 or... or GHK. And I have patients call me, can we use this? I'm like, if you can obtain it, and yes, I'm fine with that, but I can't provide it to you right now based on what's going on. And then we have biometric monitoring. We have people wear whoops. Uh, other people have their Apple Watch. Some people have mats and, and measure their HRV. We have uh, mesenchymal stem cell therapy, so I can take your fat and give it back to you as your own stem cells, or we can send it out and be banked and do it quarterly like I do. We are going to work with the company Energy for Life and have more biophysics in the practice to rebalance electrical field and reduce pain that way. A lot of my clients use their own PEMF mats. This is much different. They'll have a wearable that helps measure your energy level and restore it. So that company's called Energy for Life. That'll be in my book that's coming out. So I think it's all, everything's positive and I just look forward to moving ahead. I feel like we're doing and offering a, a well-rounded service for the patients or always trying to improve it. Yeah, it sounds like it. And it was a happy accident that someone put you on a map for explants. Piqued my curiosity. Yeah. I'm curious. One thing we didn't talk about, something that happens a lot is conventional providers move into the integrative and functional space after their own experiences and you seem to fully embrace all of these integrative techniques and strategies and things that maybe some of your colleagues wouldn't embrace. Why do you think that is? Was that an easy sell for you? Or was there a little bit of, was there a resistance there? Well, my daughter and I genetically don't metabolize gluten. So she got really sick when she was younger 
And I had always been like unwell if I had the wrong thing. If I ate the wrong thing. Never understood it. And I had a friend of ours I trained with. I would get like sick if I had a beer and chicken wings and feel terrible. He's, he drank rum and Coke. So I started drinking that with him. Not that that's a great thing to drink with all the sugar in it, but that all stopped. And I didn't know that I was gluten intolerant or had non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is basically the problem. But that really affected my daughter when she was younger. So we worked with a functional practitioner. And in fact, when I went into solo private practice in 2017, I officed with a functional practitioner. He subleased a space to me and I got to utilize their types of services and learn from them. And we were, I'm not, I've not been a, uh, or I hope I've never been closed minded to in anything that would help a patient. I, I don't feel like I'm that way. And certainly there's a lot of things that from a collaborative standpoint, would help patients. So I, whatever we can do to help patients, I am all for. Uh, I always have a lot to learn. People probably think I'm way out there, but I know people who are a lot further out there than me in the spaces. You're in Austin. People like it and they want to come spend time with us and try to get as well as possible. And I have great friends all over the country who always are telling me about new things. And when I visit them, I just visited Park City and heard about a bunch of new things. So I think it's a great time, to be honest. Yeah. I didn't really take a dive down any of your videos or interviews too much before this conversation. So I didn't know coming in that you'd be down to earth and you're operating. I have this lens I operate through. What's the best service to the client? I feel like you operate through that same lens, really. Like, I'll just keep making it better. I don't really care what anybody else thinks. I just try to do what I think's right for the patients. Let everything else sort itself out. It's fine. Yeah, that'd be a good part of the Hippocratic Oath. But this is maybe offensive to someone, but a lot of times surgeons have the stereotype of being egotistical jerks, especially in cosmetics. But you don't come from that background. You come from this empathy-driven oncology background, I would say. Yeah, you can spend a lot of time patting yourself on the back and all you'll get is a sprained wrist. <laughs> Things in cancer are incredibly humbling. And yeah, I work with yeah. very bright people. Those were always the best environments when everybody had, it was very purpose-driven in a multidisciplinary environment. Everybody's very smart. They knew their lanes and they just tried to help take care of patients. So those were the best times of my career. So I miss those days at times, but I'm almost 55 and I don't do microsurgery anymore. Those times have passed me by. I think we have a lot to add in this space and help patients and that's priority. Yeah. It's a, it sounds like it was a good environment to grow up in, in your medical education and early career. So yeah. What do you want to make sure people know as this conversation of breast implant illness, as we wrap up, what message do you want to be putting out there? It feels like you're living in your mission and purpose. Yeah. I, I feel to help people. I've done my show, not to just do a show, but to just highlight things that are confusing that you may read about or hear about breast implant illness. So you can listen to my show, Breast Implant Illness with Dr. Robert Whitfield. You can follow us on Instagram. We, we post a lot of things to help that process of education just go forth. And that's at Breast Implant Illness Experts. And then, of course, on our URLs, which are drrobertwhitfield.com and breastimplantillnessexpert.com, as well as on our YouTube channel, Breast Implant Illness Expert. We try to provide just as much educational content as we can. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's reviewthispodcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.